From Chicago, this is Vertical Ministry with James McDonald. What every heart longs for, what every church can be. Hey everybody, I'm Landon and I'm excited for you to take a listen to these frankly just amazing conversations all about vertical ministry and why we believe it can be absolutely life-changing. Stetzer here with James McDonald. Of course, we're talking about vertical ministry and the Vertical Ministry Podcast. James, we've been having lots of discussion about different topics, but we're going to talk some about one of the pillars of the vertical church, and that's in and around leadership. Yep. I wanted to talk with you because there's some there's a lot of fascinating things. Well, one unique thing is you're a church planter. Now, people have planted churches, right? We know people have started churches, but then you're a church planter who's then helping facilitate and lead a church planting focused organization. So it's not just, hey, I, and, and it's great. I mean, we're, we're for everybody plants churches, right. but now you're planting churches that plant churches, and now we're at multiple generations yeah. of church planting. We have great grandchildren. We have great grandchildren, but we got to tell a story. So, so yep. how did you end up in church planting in the first place? Well, if I could just, um, you know, ask permission of your uh, audience to speak candidly without yeah. seeming you know, I think that uh, our study of the New Testament was such that, um, you know, we find that God's plan is the church. And in Bible college, I heard a missions professor say that the mission of missions is the church and the mission of the church is missions. Now, I've been saying that for so long that people think I said it, but it, it, it wasn't original with me, but it, it certainly is biblical. So you begin, you know, in a small group and then someone comes to Christ and now there's several new Christians and now the small group's getting full. And so you birth another small group. And then you multiply, 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 and eventually you have to get to replication. This somewhere else. And generally speaking, it emerges with staff. I remember two particular staff members standing with me at a space in our Rolling Meadows campus. You've been there, Ed. And uh, they said, are we going to keep talking about church planning or are we going to do it? And Hmm. I was reluctant to let go of our best youth pastor and our best young adult pastor. But in 18 months, we sent out about 700 people from our church to seed these two new churches. And, you know, what church planter wouldn't love to start with 350 people? And uh, so off they went, and uh, both of them have flourished, and both of those churches still exist here uh, about 17 or 18 years later. Wow. Okay, so, so when you first started this church, how, how, old, how old is this church? The Harvest will be uh, 30 years old wow. in uh, 2018. So okay. we started in 1988. 1988. You were 12. You uh, <laughs> showed up in I town. was 27. 27, okay. Had you done stuff before? What were you before that? I was a youth pastor youth for pastor. several years. Youth and pastors then, make great church planners. I know. Because they, so, they, they know they, the culture. They and, know to engage. And they, they've been through they, a lot. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They've learned how to get people to, uh, to listen to them some. All right, so, so you came here. Why did you pick this area? Well, I was a student at Trinity, okay. and Kathy and I had been praying in seminary. Our prayer was, God, will go anywhere you want us to go, but if you would allow it, we'd like to stay. Ministries that we had seen that flourished had long-tenured senior pastors without a lot of transitions. And I know God moved Paul around, and God moves a lot of people around, but we felt, felt called to stay. Yeah. So I didn't have any idea what I was getting into, and I prayed to pastor as a senior pastor yeah. one church for my lifetime. But off we went with 18 people in September of 1988, and... Uh, um, we went to Chicago because we were contacted by a group of these 18 people. It was from five different churches. Oh, they'd, okay. been, they'd been praying for oh, over a year. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I didn't want to plant a church because anybody I n- ever knew who planted a church always spent, you know, forever. You know, it was like 50 people sitting around a couple of card tables. It was never became, I just knew a lot of church plants mm-hmm. that struggled. But of course, church planting has become such a huge thing in the last few years. And, um, so yeah, so we planted a church when not many people were doing it. Yeah. 88, I planted my first church in 88 and that they had, uh, a national church planning conference. It could be like in a phone booth. I, I know, mean, it wasn't a lot not, of people doing it. Well, no one's talking about yeah. it. And most church plans that you heard about failed. Yeah. yeah. And it really has changed, and, and some key people okay. have changed so, it. So you showed up. You uh, you come to this this community, what, what, northwestern suburbs of Chicago, Correct. I guess we would say. Yep. Yep. Um, and and what do you do? I mean, do you knock on doors? Do you do a mailer? How do you tell people? You... I love the practicality of your questions. Yeah. So what we did was was we had the 18 people, which were adults, all adults. Yeah. So it was, I think, um, maybe eight 
eight couples, plus one of the couples had grown children, two grown children. So call it eight couples, and they invited all their friends to a banquet. Mm. I brought a friend of mine in from Nashville to sing. It wasn't a big name, not a draw, nothing like that. But we had music, and I got up and spoke and shared the vision. We still have the video of it. And really? I stood up in this banquet hall. We had a little under 200 people. Adults uh-huh. show up to the bank. They invited every single friend they could possibly Gosh, think they had of. 200 people. They invited everybody. They every yeah. single person. And compelling. Uh-huh. And, and some of these people were compelling and uh, interesting. People. It wasn't a church split. Right. It literally was groups of people from a lot of different places right. that were... I do remember one uh, of our, our founders. He's in with the Lord now. But we went around the table before there was a church. And we said, you know, each why do you want to plant a church? Why do you want to plant a church? And he said, because we're needing feeding. Wow, okay. <laughs> and they had been 38 years in one church down in the city that was kind of struggling. And so they came up for something vital and fresh and new. And uh, yep, we kicked it off. Okay. And where, and so you had, you had the banquet. And so when do you start having services? Like, is that the right in the next week? Well, you know, now our church planters, they come out of our training center and they take three or four months in a local church yeah, yeah, yeah. that we've planted. Then they go to the area and they start tilling the soil. And I'm always kind of the guy who's, oh, I can't believe it takes them this yeah. long. You know, back <laughs> in my did day, it. we did it with my sticks day. And <laughs> strings. And <laughs> so I'm already, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm that guy. <laughs> but we finished up uh, at a church that we were on staff at during seminary that sent us off with their blessing, asked us to go at least five miles away, which we did. We didn't take anybody from that church. In fact, people in that church would ask me about it and say, well, you know, I just really can't tell you. We don't want to take any from that church. And to this day, that uh, senior pastor is a very dear friend to both of us, Colin Smith. Oh, you're kidding. Yep. I didn't, okay, that was the yeah. church I was oh, on really? staff wow, there. Okay, all right. Yep. All right, so, so, so we went out, and, yeah. and as you were asking, and and uh, these people went around, you know, and they invited all of these other people. We went five miles away, mm-hmm. and we I finished at that church on staff on the 31st of August, and we had our first service on the 18th of September. You know, that's not what we do nowadays. <laughs> I like know. you said, you cultivate the field now. Yeah, yeah. But, but, and but it would have been better if we had it taken longer. But the Lord blessed it. You yep. said, so did you meet in a school, a warehouse? Mm-hmm. In a high school, that high was a really school. miraculous provision, yeah. and uh, the Lord just could get these miracles, and you're yeah. praying for a location, praying for an office, praying right. for all these things, and God opens doors, and you had to knock on quite a few, but we started in Rolling Meadows High School, and uh, I think we had you know less than the banquet, a little under 200 people, yeah, and yeah. then the worst part, of course, was that every week for the first 10 weeks, the attendance went down, oh, down, yeah, down, yeah, down, yeah, yeah. down, yeah. down, down, yeah. down, yeah. and I remember when it fell like into the low 130s or something, and I was like, oh, oh that's when you get br- brutal. Like, it's yeah. over, it's over, yeah. I could do the math, I mean, we've got seven more weeks here, yeah. and we can fold it up, but you know, church planners go through that, and yeah. I'm glad we did. Yeah, it kind of goes, I'm mean, it's funny, because I was... We the first church in the eighty one I planned in eighty eight, we didn't do the large launch, but we did yeah. a large launch in the next one. And I the only person I was listening to was little cassette tapes of Rick Warren. So I uh-huh. sent him an email through CompuServe. Did you really? Wow. Which cost like a dollar. Amazing. Uh, and uh, and I said, What happened on the third week? And so because I was freaking out, but then it just kind of declined. So 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 how long were you in the high school? We met in the high school for seven years. Seven years. So yep. set up and tear down. Set up and tear seven down for years. seven years. Wow. And we were in the theater. Then the theater was full. We went yeah. to the gym. Yeah. Then the gym was full. We went back to the theater and two services. Then we were back to the gym and two services. Wow. So by the time we moved into our building, we had how many people after seven years, Ed? I don't know. I was going to ask you. Yeah, well, because it's really not predictable. It's yeah. different in every instance. Yeah, yeah. But we had our first attendance over 1,000. Yeah. Our first attendance over 900, our first attendance over 800. All of those happened the same day when we got into a building. Really? We had never had an attendance over 800 at the high school, not even on Easter. Wow. And we had a little over 1,000 on our launch Sunday in the new building. So, so that just really took off. Well, do you facility. remember as a yeah. church planner, you're like, man, we roll this thing up and yeah. put it in a box every week. Nobody oh, even yeah, knows yeah. we exist. Exactly. And, and that's why the, even on Sunday, the signage that you place everywhere is so, so important really because um, yeah. once you get that permanent location and get your, your presence known, it really yeah. is really okay, helpful. So a year in. You're, yep. you're, you moved into high school. You're, this is September 88, so to, September of 89. Yep. What's your attendance that, that fall of 89? Do you remember? I think our attendance in the fall of 89 was around 250. Okay, that's, and that's huge for a new church. I mean, it's very unusual to grow that quickly. Well, we've got a, we got a real sad story coming, though. Oh, tell me. So by the 18-month mark, which yeah. would be spring of 1990, um, it became apparent that the quick start... Um, three or four months since I'd met the people really didn't allow the proper amount of time for getting on the same page. There was great enthusiasms, but what ended up happening is they really had more of a vision for a more fundamental 
um, um, gospel message with a public invitation every Sunday. Right. We want to see our, and that's what they had known. God bless them, you know. I but at the time it was pretty painful because, um, you know, not uncommon. Twelve, though some of them came back. Twelve of the eighteen people we started the church with left at the eighteen month wow. mark and took a hundred and fifty wow. people with them. Ouch! So we went from four hundred down to about two fifty, and it was a really, really crushing time. And uh, but I've promised the Lord that uh, I won't ever tell that story without telling the part about what I got wrong. Because I think over time you tend to remember what everybody else yeah, did wrong, so sure, but you sure. forget what you learned. So my my uh, kind of big leadership lesson in that season was um, I was, you know, you, you and I are such good friends, but I'm, as you know, pretty forthright. And a big part of that is really built from the how broken bones grow back stronger. Because then what I really, where I blew it was I kind of placated some of the people mm-hmm. and they would complain and I would say, well, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Right. And, you know, like I remember them, they wanted me to tell people they couldn't raise their hands in worship. Remember Which this, is very this important is the 80s. that you would do. The, it was this the 80s. 80s. I and we the are 80s. a Bible church after all. So, exactly. <laughs> but instead of saying, no, I can't do that. That's not in the Bible. I would say, well, you know, I'll talk to them. But in my heart, I didn't agree with right, them. Right. But I wouldn't just say. I was young yeah. and foolish and I placated them. And so I had to finally, my dad always said three things, feed the people, love the people, and admit when you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And most pastors go down over number three. So I literally had to stand up when our church was at 250. And I was like, where's my friends? And I had to say, you know, I, I really blew this wow. here. Wow. And I just, I, I, I wasn't candid. I wasn't forthright to call it sin. Yeah. Call it. Right. I, I didn't tell the truth. I said I would and I didn't. And this is a hard sentence. But if you give a person an impression that's a wrong impression and you know it at the base of that, that's that's for sure wrong. You know. And so now I'm like almost like hyper. Say yeah. It, yeah. You go say, you say it. This is what we are. Say who we are. This is who we are. Yeah. This is who we yeah. are. And, but that makes and, sense because uh, it is a your I mean, it, it was a big issue. So eighteen months in, hundred and fifty people leave. So you're back down to uh, two fifty uh, and drop down again. And so and so and, and, and what, probably worth noting too. One of the things that we talk about in church planning is some of the challenges of an existing core group because the existing core group has kind of a vision that's different than the planter's vision. Sometimes that's hard, right? And so that kind of came. There wasn't enough time to cultivate that clarity of vision. Right. Agreed. All right. So 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 then, how many years in before you planted your first church? So we planted our first church uh, 12 years. 12 years. It. Yeah, okay. we were in our building in 95, yeah. and we planted our first church in March of 2000 and our second church in the fall of 2000. Yeah. Now, how many have you planted? Uh, of course, I, I mean, let's talk the network as a whole because I recognize there's daughters and granddaughters. How many churches are now part of the Harvest Bible Fellowship Network? So we have church planters out right now building core groups so that probably by the time this airs or certainly by the end of this year, we'll have a right around 200 church plants. Yeah, that's pretty stunning. Yeah. So um, the, now 12 years. So you had to, in a sense, re-engage that DNA. In other words, you planted 12 years earlier, but the fact that you planted, by the time you planted again, that DNA was probably forgotten or it was... It was, you know, germinal at the beginning, but now not there anymore. So how did you get your church to engage in church planting when maybe they hadn't thought about it for a decade? Well, the first big thing that was actually important is, was um, I can remember going to a lot of pastors' meetings with all of our church planters, and we, I needed the book Vertical Church. And I didn't even know what to call it at the time. I knew what our pillars were. I knew what our emphasis was. I knew what our ministry philosophy was. But I didn't, um, I didn't. We needed that badly. This is what we are. This is our distinction. This is what God has called us to. So we needed the book Vertical Church. We needed the training materials, some of which you've now reviewed uh, pretty extensively. And we needed to uh, teach our church. I can remember in 1999, we had a traditional missions program with, I don't know, 15 to 18 um, worldwide missionaries, typical. You know, this guy's cousin works at Campus Crusade, and, and this lady's nephew is with Frontiers, and I'd been on the board of Pioneers for a number of years, so we had some Pioneers missionaries. But, you know, they were seeing various levels of fruitfulness. I'd call them ideal to exceptional missionaries, but they were the very traditional model of go out into the hardest fields. And uh, what we really had a heart for was uh, to change our missions ministry where we instead of 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, all these different things where nobody seems to have enough ownership to hold the ministry, the missionary accountable for fruitfulness, we decided to go fully into church planters only. Mm. And thank God for mercy ships, and thank God for Christian colleges, and all these great missions emphasis. I'm not an enemy in any way of the parachurch, but we decided to focus exclusively on church planting. 
And so every missions dollar that we put out there is for the purpose or toward the goal of church planting. And, and let me interrupt, because one of the things when people, the way we tend to use language kind of on the in, in, inside conversation is church planting for a lot of people means North America. That's not what you're talking about. You're doing church planting around the world. Right. So we have both um, domestic, we call it, and international church planting. We already have a training center uh, for, so now we're actually planting church planting regions. And so we have a church planting uh, uh, um, uh, center in Romania. Yeah. We just finished a big, big training center there that we've built. And so they're bringing in people from all over uh, Eastern Europe uh, and beyond to plant churches there. We have a training center now in Haiti. That's going. We have churches going up all over in the Caribbean. And so, you know, um, they shouldn't have to come to Chicago to yeah. learn how to plant a that's church. Right, that's right. All right. What, looking back, you've been uh, you've planted a church that's grown to a, a very substantial size. A, a giga church is the term that some some might catch on. Over ten thousand plus people. Um, you you have planted now daughter churches, granddaughter churches, even helped facilitate a, a, a movement that is built around this. What go, go all the way back thirty years? What do you wish you knew? Or what we wish you would have done different in church planting that the church planters listening can learn from James McDonald? Um, thank you for the opportunity to, um, you know, share out of that um, uh, area of our life. I mean, I have a lot of things I'd share personally, a lot of things I'd share about preaching, about being a pastor, about... But in the in the area of church planting, um, it's come out a little bit already. I joked about starting quickly and, right. you know, the olden days and all that. But we should have taken longer. We should have um, more firmly established our core group. I also wish that I hadn't have placed my hopes quite as much in people. You know, it says in John chapter 2 that uh, Jesus entrusted himself to no man, for he knew what was in man. Hmm. And, and to be able to look at people without being cynical or jaded, but just to be aware that human nature is there and to attach myself to people in a way that I'm going to be unduly devastated by their betrayal or disaffection or transfer or all of the above. I think that if I had have had a, a, a better way of connecting, you know, you give yourself, you don't have anything. You don't have a building, you don't have a program, you have nothing. And church planters give themselves. And I would just say to every church planter, make sure that you're giving yourself in a way that you can help in a healthy way wean people off of their dependence upon you mm. and and you know as much as we can we want to connect people with the church and with the lord yeah. and let a little friendship on the side be the byproduct instead of putting sort of relational capital with us at the center of our recruitment and building model interesting i guess i'm intrigued guys i mean i see you as a very uh, relational person yeah and yet you're sort of cautioning around relationship. Of course, the church plant at the beginning is so much, there's so much churn. There's, there's, uh, I heard one person talk about it. some people are there as scaffolding. They help get it built and then they kind of come down and they go away and, yeah. and, uh, you know, partly they intentionally or maybe unintentionally. So, so how do you, so I wouldn't, I just wouldn't normalize my call. So we felt called to come and stay. We prayed to stay. Yeah. We have stayed. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I would have understood that just because God's calling you to pastor one church for yeah. a lifetime doesn't mean that God's calling people to have one pastor for a lifetime. Oh, that's really good. Okay. So, you so know, Rick Warren, you like to quote Rick yeah. Warren he, and he is so great. He, he says, you're preaching to a parade. Yeah. And I think that's a great phrase. You have to think of it in terms yeah. of people. And so I just would be less attached to the people. I would okay. be less hurt when they went for a variety of good yeah. or not so good reasons. I would be uh, less a confident in my ability to change the behavior of others. I would mm. be more accepting of people as they are, yeah. thankful for their contribution, but not insistent upon their, you know, allocating major life resources to working on things. I'm very interested in working on everything, but not everyone is. That's good. Okay, so 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 that's one area we kind of look through and think through now. So let's let's move forward 30 years, and now you're going to plant again. You're going to have to leave the... Uh, I, I, I don't know if the giga thing is going to catch on, but anything above ten thousand, and you're, and you're you way can above make that, it happen. and you're yeah. way above that. But but uh, but again, it's uh, so so you're going to leave the giga church, and you're going to go plant a new church in. I'm going to give you. Let's see, you're going to go to San Diego because that's where if you're going to leave Chicago, you got to go to San Diego. It's beautiful mm -hmm. weather. What would you do now to plant a church? Give me your strategy. I would do so and so because surely you're giving advice to church planters what they should do. Yeah. So what would Pastor James McDonald planting in San Diego do? Well, I think, first of all, I had a couple of key people at the beginning. I had uh, a lady named Kathy Elliott, who was my personal assistant for 26 years. 
And she, but she started women's ministry. She answered the phone. She was involved in everything. And I had a guy named Rick Donald, who's also still with me. And, um, he was my associate pastor, my compliment, my, and I would, if I was doing it again, I would for sure find those complimentary people to partner with people that love you unconditionally, people that are committed to the work and committed to God's work in you. And, um, that would be one thing. I think that I would be, um, um, even, uh, quite a bit more careful about the exact location that I think that how many people can get to that place within how many minutes um, is a hugely important thing. Um, I think that I would be even more cautious, and I've been somewhat cautious, but I would be even more cautious in any sentence that I ever spoke about any other church in the area, ever. And, you know, when you have to debate with others to entrench your own position, you're on shaky ground, and I, I just think I understand that a lot better now. And I think that pastors don't always, my pastor growing up said, every time you throw dirt, you lose ground. And, and there's wisdom in that. And I think that pastors that are, even if you have your own distinctions, even have your own convictions, that's awesome. But I just wouldn't establish those by putting them in an offset against what other people are doing. I think that um, those are some thoughts I have about doing it again. I like it. So one of the, you know, because you're in this unique space, you're sort of, someone who's, uh, you've sent out a lot of planters, and you've sent out a lot of planters who've really planted larger churches. Yeah. So is there something that you see or that you'd uh, you'd say, you know, having worked with a lot of planters and sent out people, um, I've, I've noticed this about them, uh, maybe in yourself or in them, that has made them a successful planter? And again, I'm, I'm for small church plants, I'm for big church plants, we're for all of them, but it, your harvest has uniquely produce some larger church plants. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things, candidly, is um, it's it's surprising to me um, that more pastors don't become convinced intuitively of how Im- actually important the worship service is. Hmm. So you know, all this energy goes into all these ancillary things, and and my my. Um, you know, my uh, small groups is great. I really believe in that. And, and children's ministry, of course, and student ministry as soon as you can. And, and um, you know, counseling and helping these people and solving this problem and discipling your board. And at the end of the day, the vast majority of people have one experience with you. It happens in that room. It involves music, preaching, and other things that you've thought of. And how impactful that is. I, I think a lot of people think, well, it's a one or it's two or it's a three. I would say that there's not one dial that's one through three. I'd say there's about 10 dials and they all have mixtures of like a hundred on each dial. Mm. It's very complex. And like, I'll just give one little example. What happens at the end of the sermon to get to the music? The smoothness of that transition the match of the content with the message itself. That, that is, and then what is the last thing that is said before they go out the door? Mm-hmm. Their hearts are never more ready for a deposit than when it's the final before the goodbye. Yeah. And I think that those two little things right there are massive. We, I couldn't even count the number of hours that we've spent working on that. Mm. And now take every part of the service. I just think a lot of pastors and church planners spend a ton of time working on things that no one will ever know or see about yeah. when they could be putting more time into the men. If that happens here every week, I'm going to bring my friends. Interesting. Now, the current mood in church planting is mostly not what you're saying. The current mood in church planning is mostly don't be attractional, uh, be incarnational, do it relationally, disciple into church plants and things of that sort. Um, but you're, you're sort of laying out something that the worship service becomes a central import. I think a lot of people sort of do that, even though they might say that they don't do that. You're saying be intentional about it. Yeah, I'm just saying that at the end of the day, of the Lord's people in community worshiping the Lord in the highest and best, fullest. If, if, if you can watch people sing songs half-heartedly with arms folded and you don't think that needs work this week, that's a problem. 
If you can preach a sermon that was faithful to the text, but you were even a little bored as you got to the end of it the second time, that's a fail. And I would say, if we fail at that, it's hard to succeed no matter what else is great. I believe in all that. We have massive emphasis on discipleship. We have thousands and thousands of people in small groups. Intentional discipleship, um, pursuit of people, and accountability, small groups. But but what I would say is that the Sunday morning service is like the wood-burning stove in a warehouse. It's not the work. It's not the work of discipleship. And in that sense, I agree with the incarnational model. It's not the work. But listen, when the fire goes out in the stove, the work stops. The fire in the stove is the thing that casts warmth across the warehouse. And when people get cold, they stop and they start shivering and fold their arms and they rub their arms and they try to stay warm themselves. People don't give themselves to others in Christ unless they're warm. And the worship service is what keeps everyone warm. All right, James, we've been talking a lot about church planting, but I want to actually ask you, kind of as we close, to give us some leadership advice, because we'll be talking a lot about leadership uh, at the Vertical Church Conference, and we're excited about that. And so if you could, uh, you know, you're now, you know, fast forward 30 years, and what leadership advice, I know we're going to do a lot there at the conference, but what leadership advice would you give church planters, and really pastors in general, but applicable to all, about ministry and leadership? You know, I think one of the most important decisions a leader has to make is, is am I going to require of myself a balance between public and private? Am I going to allow myself to go all over and do all these things, but know in my heart that I'm not maintaining the private uh, world, the private life? I think when a, a leader has to make a decision to keep his public and his private congruent, if he doesn't, you know, something not very great is coming. Yeah. And we've been talking about vertical ministry. Thank you, Pastor James, for letting me interview you uh, the Vertical Church Conference. You and I both will be talking. We'll be talking about leadership, church planning, that's a passion, and lots of other things. And we hope to see everybody there. But thanks for taking the time. Yeah, glad. Thanks, Ed. It's going to be a great conference. We hope everybody will be there and be blessed by it.